My name is Dave. I'm the pastor here. Thanks for being with us, and thanks, everybody, for joining us online. What a crazy time that we're living in. Every time we turn around, there's a new uh, episode of the coronavirus. It's like we're binge-watching this goofy pandemic over and over and over again. But God bless you for being here. God bless you for being people of faith and commitment and boldness. And uh, like Eric mentioned earlier, I'm winding down my time here at West Winds, which is, which is filling me with all kinds of nostalgia and memory. And this month, I really want to want to make some things explicit that have probably been implicit over the last 16 years and eight months. I want to highlight things that I was trying to model, ways in which I was trying to lead, things I was trying to do and instill into our church and community that, that, that maybe you didn't pick up on. Because as everyone knows, subtlety is my great gift. And so I'm going to forego subtlety for these last few weeks. And as often happens when, when there are, you know, particularly emotional events in my life, like Monday night, which was so great and so fun. Thank you, those of you who are here. Um, I, I end up reflecting on the scripture. And I look at the Bible and then I read my life and I compare and I contrast them. And I, I started thinking about all of the things that Paul describes in his second letter to the church in Corinth. Now, if you're unfamiliar with 1 and 2 Corinthians, these are two letters that Paul wrote to a very unruly congregation. We think he wrote at least two more letters because 1 Corinthians references Paul's earlier letter. So that would make 1 Corinthians, it's in our Bible, probably 2 Corinthians. And then 2 Corinthians in our Bible also references something from an earlier letter that's not in 1 Corinthians and isn't the thing that he says is in the other letter. So, so we think there's probably at least four letters to this church because they sucked. They really did. They were horrible. We read about them getting drunk during communion. They're accused of having orgies during church. They're gossiping and quarreling and arguing all of the time. So if anybody ever says to you, I can't believe you go to a trash church like Westwinds, you can say, well, at least we're not as bad as those guys in the Bible. Yeah, so Paul writing to them is he's mad. He's really angry at them all the time. And, and we don't always get this. I mean, sometimes we read the Bible and, and we read it like it's a speech or we read it like it's a presidential address. But if you imagine uh, Danny DeVito, that's probably a fair historical comparison to the Apostle Paul, reading Corinthians, you realize like the last four chapters of 2 Corinthians is dripping with sarcasm, um, defensiveness, accusation. I mean, he's, he's worked up. And, and the problem is that no matter what he says or no matter what he does or what he's accomplished, the, the people just don't listen. So he goes through and, and, and he says all these funny, funny, funny things. Listen up. I don't want anybody to think that I'm foolish. But even if you do think I'm a foolish, then even if you do think I'm a fool, that's okay because I'm going to boast just a little bit. Now, what I'm saying with this boastful confidence has nothing to do with the Lord. It's just me being a fool. But since you boast about how great you are, I guess I'll boast too. For you listen to all those other fools because you're so wise yourselves. So why don't you listen now to someone who has made you his slave? You're like, okay, wow. Good job, the Apostle Paul. Thanks a lot. And then he goes on to compare himself to other pastors. Are they servants of Christ? I'm better than them. Yep, that's what he says in the Bible. Oh, you like that other pastor? I'm better than them. Listen to me, I'm talking like a madman, but I've achieved far more significant accomplishments than them. I've committed far greater labors. I've been imprisoned more times than them. I've been beaten more times than them, often near death. I am better than those quote unquote super apostles. That's hilarious. And then he goes on and tells them at the end of chapter 12, he goes, I'm coming to see you one more time. And I'm afraid that when I get there, you might not be what I want. And you might not find me the way you wish. I'm afraid that in our church, there might be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. Nevertheless, at the end of chapter 13, Paul says, I'm praying for your restoration. Now, I read you all that because I want you to know how raw and how honest and how pained the Apostle Paul was when dealing with his church. 
And I want you to know, that's how we all feel sometimes. I moved here when I was 28 in 2005, and uh, our church was really, really unhealthy then. Um, some of you may remember, some of you might not have been here, and um, usually if we make reference to it, it's in passing, just to sort of acknowledge that our church has been through some stuff, but it was really ugly. It was really ugly. There was a huge division at that time between our staff and our elders. Uh, they didn't really trust each other, and our staff in particular was really toxic at the time. In fact, when I came to candidate for the job, like for my job interview, we had nine different staff members tell me in my one-on-one -on -one evaluations with them that other staff members should be fired. I mean, it was a, a viper pit. And, and at the same time, it's not that they were evil people. They were just all really badly hurt, frustrated, and confused. And sometimes good people in bad circumstances, they, they turn on each other. And that's absolutely what had happened uh, in our church. And in the season in which we didn't have a pastor, there was about two years between when the previous pastor left and when I arrived, um, many people who once called Westwind's home just sort of evaporated for one reason or another. They just emptied the place out. And so we were left with a, a shell of our former church. And, I, and I'm not sure that the people who stayed around were necessarily the most helpful or positive or exciting people. I think they were the people who just weren't allowed to go to any other churches. <laughs> and when I got here, um, it, didn't, it didn't start great. Not by a long shot. In fact, I remember my first weekend when I was the pastor, we had three services that weekend, and, uh, and I struck out in all three sermons. I got up, I preached, didn't feel good. Got up the next morning, because we did Saturday night, two Sundays, and it, it didn't go good, and it didn't go good. And... Um, you let me know it. And uh, I got a lot of advice from our elders about how to make some changes. So I took that advice and made some changes. You know, I want to be found faithful and um, um, it didn't go good either. And uh, then our staff gave me some advice. I took that advice, which was in direct opposition to the advice of the elders. And that didn't go good. And there was about my first three weeks, or pardon me, my first three months, I want you to know that Every single time was bad, meaning it didn't connect. People were not appreciative. I didn't feel good about it. It was frustrating and confusing, and it was deeply unsettling for me. It, it was a year, a, a full honest to God, 12 months before I felt like I was starting to get my footing and if there were little moments here and there inside of that first 12 months where I thought, okay, that, that worked. I, I feel okay about that. I was wrong. And people were quick to point it out. Um, and I, I, want, I want you to know that when your new pastor gets here, like the, the deck is stacked against them. And we have got to come around that new pastor with love and support, and optimism, and friendship. A, a lot of people made a lot of suggestions to me, and I think they, they meant those suggestions well, but they, they weren't helpful. And a lot of people voted with their attendance. Well, I didn't really like this week. I'll take a couple weeks off, see if he gets any better. Yeah, because that does wonders for your confidence when all of a sudden people just stop showing up because you aren't good at your job. I mean, like, fair enough. I got a, some growing to do, but, but it was so, so, so crazy. Our church, when I got here, was about 500 people and uh, had been bigger than that private previously, but it was about 450, 500 people when I got here. And our highest attended services ever, still to this day, were the first Christmas Eve that I got here. And we went from, from 500 people, 450, 500 people each weekend to that first Christmas Eve, just under 2,000. Um, and I thought, oh, that's so cool. All these people are going to give it another chance. They're going to, and they never came back. And I remember feeling like such a failure. I felt so stupid. Like I just, like God gave me this great church and I wanted to serve and be so, so good. And I was so not good. Now, I'm going to be really vulnerable with you this morning um, because I want you to understand 
some of what was happening in me while I was your pastor that probably you didn't see and probably you won't understand. But I came from a really healthy and supportive church environment into one that was not healthy and not supportive. And consequently, there has never been a time at Westwinds where I felt valued or affirmed or embraced. Now, if ever I say that to anyone, they immediately go, how can that possibly be true? Everybody loves you. We love you. We've been here for so long, and you're so great. I'm not saying that it's the truth. I'm not saying I wasn't loved or valued or embraced. What I'm saying is I never felt it or experienced it. Some people are motivated by achievement. Some people are motivated by power or money. I'm motivated by love and friendship. And, and that was absent, certainly at the beginning. And so I had some figuring out to do, because that first season was awful, absolutely awful. And I wondered how quickly I'd get fired. I wondered if I'd have to send my bags packing and go home humiliated and embarrassed. I was under a tremendous amount of strain. And I mean, I think in my first year here, I gained almost 40 pounds and I certainly lost all my black hair. That happened. And I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. And of course, I was heavily criticized, and, and then one of the really tricky things about being criticized in the lobby on a Sunday morning is then you have to clean out your heart and shed your guilt and then get up and preach the gospel, usually four minutes after somebody's called you a whole bunch of names, which is a, a, a kind of spiritual gymnastics that I didn't know people were capable of. But people often criticize me or accuse me of, of wanting to be relevant or wanting to be cool or wanting to be shocking. And, um, and the, the, the thing is, is that we, we were doing things, I was doing things in, a, in an effort to make sure people could understand the good news of the gospel of God. And so one of the things that was really problematic when I first got here was the translation of the Bible that I preferred to use. I really liked at that time to use the message translation by Eugene Peterson, which is a very colloquial, easy to understand um, version of the Bible. And people thought that I was selling out. How could you do this? You're watering down the scriptures. You don't care about the truth. All you care about is, is you know, is the connecting to the culture. Look, I, I'm a missionary. Christians are missionaries to their culture. And if you're a communicator, not, it, it doesn't matter what you say, it matters what they hear. And if they can't hear what you're saying, you're not effectively communicating. But those accusations stung. You don't care about the truth. You just care about being relevant. And then people would say, oh, you're trying too hard to be cool. <laughs> Listen, I'm cool. I don't have to try. <laughs> but it was just weird that people decided to... Uh, you know, comment on my tattoos or on my clothing. It was just so p puzzling, so puzzling. And of course, the one that, that really, I think the criticism that has merit is people would accuse me of, of being shocking, like a Christian shock jock or a, a radio host. And it, it's true, I, I am crass. It is a shortcoming of my ministry. It limits my effectiveness in some ways. Um, but I grew up in church. I grew up around pastors. I am very well familiar with not only Christians in North America, but global Christianity. And I am concerned about the tendency of Christians to play it safe and to keep it nice. Because the world is not safe. And being nice is often a way of being disingenuous, of lying about how things are really going. Hey, how's everything going? Oh, good, yeah, fine, thanks, thanks for asking. R really? Yep. And I value authenticity. And I have modeled my life after Jesus, who had no patience for people who played it safe and kept it nice, who cried out for peace when there was no peace. 
Jesus saved his harshest critiques for insiders, for religious types, for the temple establishment. Jesus was a boundary breaker and said provocative and difficult things that people found hard to accept. I modeled my ministry after Elijah, mocking the prophets of Baal, saying deeply inappropriate and culturally insensitive things to provoke a response. I've modeled my ministry after Ezekiel, the crazed prophet from the first, temp, from the first testament who cut off his own hair and cut off his beard with a sword, who covered his hands in cow manure and flung it and stomped around in an effort to break people out of their little bubbles. Um, my intent was always and remains not to be shocking, but to be provocative because I think the task of the preacher is holy provocation to say, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead. Now, these are the things I was trying to do. These are the things for which I was criticized, but the fact remains that I, I was failing and because I'm motivated by friendship, by relationship, by, by love and wasn't getting it, I had to figure some stuff out. Because I was never going to get that. And I realized I got a choice to make. Quit and go home. Or figure out how to do this without approval. And one of the things that I've learned is that the need for approval is the fear of man. Now, I'd preached that sermon a hundred times. I knew that. But now that I was the one needing to hear that sermon, man, I had some growing up to do. And so I did. I grew. I said, okay, for better or for worse, God has placed me here now, in this context, to serve these people, and I'm going to give it 110%, no matter what. I am going to pursue my calling with courage and passion every day. Every day. And it was painful, friends. It was painful. I can still tell you the name of the first friend I made, and I can tell you I didn't make a friend here until I'd been here for more than five years. I didn't have, I didn't have someone to go to the movies with. And then during all that time, when it was so bumpy, um, I learned that I gotta dress my wounds, and I gotta stop picking at my scabs, and when I'm finally healed, then I can share the stories of my scars. Now, I'm offering this to you as a grid for your own life because there will undoubtedly be times where your students don't like you, where your employees don't respect you, where your children don't want you, where you are not popular, where you are at best tolerated. And when you are being wounded by the people around you that God has called you to serve, you got to dress your wounds and stop picking at your scabs so you can tell the stories of your scars. Here's what I mean. When you get hurt, you got to open wound. The first thing you got to do is you got to clean it and disinfect it. Because when you're, when you're wounded like that, that's when you're ripe for infection. And the infection is going to make that wound a lot worse and a lot more painful. See, wounds happen. Wounds happen in a romance. Wounds, wounds happen in a marriage. Wounds happen in a church. You're going to get hurt. You cannot get through life without getting hurt. Stop being so worried about it. You're going to fall off your bike. You're going to crash your car. You're going to get sick. It, that's because that's you're alive. You know who doesn't get sick? Dead people. So rejoice. But when you get wounded, man, you got to clean that wound out with prayer. Like the little things that are dirty inside of that wound, the little contaminants, the tough bits, the dirty bits, you, you gotta clean that stuff out with prayer, with sober reflection, with meditation. 
You, you've got to clean it out, and, and then you've got to dress the wound. You, you've got to cover it so that nothing else gets in there. You know, I refuse to be wound identified, and I refuse to let you be identified by your wounds. You're going to get hurt, so make sure you clean that hurt. You baptize it in prayer with tears so that it can heal. And then as it starts to heal, it'll scab over, right? Um, but the problem is, sometimes those scabs, they, they, they itch. Something happens, and you start wanting to pick at it. And this, I think, is what destroys so many otherwise healthy Christian people. In 27 years as a pastor, having visited 47 countries, served three local congregations, I can tell you nothing hurts Christians more than picking at your scabs. I'll give you an example. Let's say um, you, you get hurt and you go to the hospital. Well, many people, when they go to the hospital, they, they expect a visit from their pastor or from someone in the church. Well, we do a lot of that. But we miss a few. So if somebody goes to the hospital and they're hoping for a visit from someone at the church and they don't get it, well, now they're wounded. That, that hurts them. And they'll go home and the healing will begin. But then they'll hear about somebody else who didn't get a visit. And they'll go, oh, yeah, that happened to me too. I didn't get a visit. I was invisible. They didn't take care of me. And they start picking at the wound, picking at the scab, opening it up again, except this time they're not thinking about how to keep it clean. This time they're getting infected. Let's give you another example. Divorce. Somebody goes through a painful, frustrating divorce in church or a bad breakup. And they go, oh my gosh, why didn't my church come around me? I mean, I don't mean the staff or the musicians. I mean, why didn't my friends from my small group, why didn't they show me more support? I'm wounded. Yeah, that's painful. That's really painful. But you start to heal. Because healing will always begin to happen over time. So you start to heal, but then something else weird happens. You know, somebody takes your favorite parking spot or somebody spills coffee on you. They don't say sorry. And you go, see, Nobody here cares. And you start picking at the wound. And now it's going to get infected. And now something deeply dysfunctional is happening inside of your soul because you didn't have the discipline to stop picking at your scabs. Now, I can tell you these things because over and over and over again, like all of us, I would experience hurts. I would get wounded. And it's an absolute mark of discipline not to pick at the scabs. Where you go like, oh, that person just said the most brutal thing to me. What a jerk. And then at the end they said, bless you, brother. Oh, go to hell. Oh. And now every time somebody says, bless you, brother, I go, I will not touch my scab. I will not touch my scab. I will not touch. No, you, you got to just let that stuff go. Decide that you're going to move past it. Don't let yourself get sucked back in to that old pain. And then the good news is, is once it heals up, you can share the story of your scar. Everybody's got a cool scar, right? Represents a cool story. That's what I'm doing now. You know why you haven't heard this before now? Because it wasn't a scar yet. Because the healing wasn't complete because it would have been inappropriate, because you would have been contaminated, because I would have been contaminated by picking at my scabs. Oh, God forgive us. Let's move past it. Let's move past it. Now here's what I want you to know. In this life, you're gonna have trouble. Somebody smart told me that one time. You're gonna get hurt. You're going to have moments where people don't like you, where the people that you think should support you don't, and they won't. Sometimes it'll be death by faint praise, and your kids just forget to tell you Happy Mother's Day, or that they love you, or thank you for doing their laundry. Sometimes the people who are supposed to support you will out and out criticize you, mock you, humiliate you, be set against you, never mind failing to thank you for the laundry, 
They'll call you a slave. They'll demean you. There'll be little misogynists in the making. That stuff's gonna happen, and when it does, I got three pieces of advice. First, and most importantly, pursue your calling. Pursue your passion, and pursue your identity. Like, God has placed you in your life as a missionary to the people around you. God is under no illusions that you are perfect. God knows you're riddled with sin. That's why God is here to redeem you and sanctify you and restore you and grow you and mature you. So just because you're not perfect doesn't mean you can't pursue the call of God upon your life to love and bless and serve and heal everybody around you. That's why you're there. Don't let anything dissuade you from that. And do it passionately. Give yourself fully. Be zealous for good things. Don't you know how many bland and boring people there are in the world? Can you name any of them? No, they don't matter. Not to you, they don't light up your life. You see them for coffee, your day doesn't get better, it gets worse. You just had a coffee with a vampire, they drain the life right out of you. Don't be one of those. Turn the volume up on your life. Be a little extra, be too much for somebody. It's fine, they're gonna be mad at you anyway. Might as well at least enjoy yourself on the way out. And yeah, Pursue the development of you. Become the best possible version of yourself with God's help and for God's glory. Now, don't don't let your ego get in the way of your passion or your calling. Identity comes last. It's important, but the other things are importanter. Your calling is what matters most and the depth of your understanding that you're here to work with God and heal the world. So that's the first thing. Pursue your passion your calling, and your identity. Number two, show up, take care of business, and repeat. Show up. Listen, there'll be times when you're sad. There'll be times when you're hurt. There'll be times when you you, you don't even know if you can barely function or get out of bed. Yes, you can. Show up. Now, it's hard to go to Thanksgiving dinner when there's gonna be tension. I know, you can do it. Show up. It's hard to go to work when there's conflict between you and your boss. I know. Show up. Get there. Do not run from things that are hard or inconvenient or frustrating or painful because life is God's curriculum for growing you. Had I left after that first year when things were going so bad, you guys would have been fine. But I would not have. My growth and development would have stalled out. It would have stunted. It was precisely the pain and the frustration, the pressure that transformed me into a very different kind of pastor and a very different kind of human being. If I had retreated, I would not have grown at all. Because 44-year-old Dave is a whole lot different than 28-year-old Dave. 44-year-old Dave has competencies and understandings that 28-year-old Dave could never have aspired to. But it was the pressure and the discomfort and the frustration that grew me. And that's what's happening to you too. And that can't happen if you don't show up. And I mean that in two ways. Show up, like physically get there. And also get there fully. Don't be on your phone the whole time. Don't be half checked out. And Oh, I'm so tired. And this is a long weekend. I haven't been sleeping well. But nothing makes me more furious than people who talk about being tired. I guarantee you, you're not as tired than me. Or not as tired as me. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It was a late light night last night. No, you're you're fine. Give your full self into every conversation, into every engagement, into every enc- show up, and then take care. Of, what's yours to take care of? If you got work to do, do it. If you have people for whom you're responsible, look after them, and then repeat and do it over and over and over again knowing and understanding and trusting that as you do, you're gonna get stronger and more mature and more capable. It's like lifting weights. It's really hard at the beginning, and then that weight isn't so hard anymore, so you add more weight, and more, and more, and more. But you'll only do that when you show up, take care, and repeat. All right, last but not least, and this is the most important thing. When you got people that don't love or support you the way you need, when you are looking for affirmation and you're not getting it. 
you got a choice to make. And this is the thing about which I am the most proud in my whole entire life. When you're looking around going, how come I'm not getting what I need? Make the choice to love people anyway. Always, without exception, love everybody. You taught me that. You taught me that. Now, probably some of you weren't here, you know, way back in the dark old days. Um, But, you know, I had a choice to make, and I thought, if I'm going to be their pastor and they don't like me, I refuse to not like them back. I'm just going to commit to them. I'm just going to love them. And there's never going to be one day where I lay my head on the pillow and think I had more to give and I didn't give it. And that has been the most liberating and rewarding experience of my life. And we're talking today about things that were implicit and me making them explicit. Sweet Jesus, do that for somebody else. Just risk it all on love. Just commit to the people around you. Love them, spoil them, celebrate them, and uh, you're, you're going to be really happy that you did. So thank you. God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, yeah. Now, Lord, we want to thank you for your faithfulness to us. We're told again that your mercies are new every morning, and we need mercy. Man, we are not the people that we want to be. Not yet. We're not the people that you've designed us to become. Not yet. We're frustrated and just stupid sometimes, and so we don't always do it right. God, but we know every day with you is a new opportunity to move forward. So we want to move forward. We want to make sure that we love our new pastor, that we support our new pastor and their family. We want to make sure that we come around them with hope and optimism. We want to make sure that they come into a cradle of love and friendship so that our church can start humming again and pressing into the future because you've called our church, Lord, not just to be another church building in Jackson, but to be a lighthouse to those who are drowning and suffering, offering and providing for them direction and hope to safety and healing and holiness. Lord, you've called us to be a hospital to those who are sick. You've called us to be a a, a rescue mission for those who need resources. So Lord, help us live into that future, looking after each other in the process for you and for your glory. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.